Good evening, welcome to the July 28th Board of Education meeting. Uh, Mr. McCormick, would you please call the roll? Trustee Crump? Yes, ma'am. Trustee Red? Good evening, welcome to the July Trustee Present. Trumpets? Here. Trustee Mitchell? Here. Trustee Patterson? Trustee McOwen? Present. Trustee White? Trustee Saunders? Here. Trustee Miller? Here. A quorum is present. Do we have any uh, communications from the public? There are no communications this evening. Great. Uh, Dr. Hamilton, do you have a report? I do. Good evening, everyone. I hope this evening finds you all in the best of care. I have a couple of items I'd like to share with you on the superintendent's report. Um, firstly, tonight's uh, agenda, uh, we are presenting a tab for your consideration uh, for the board to acknowledge that there may be policies in place that are inconsistent with COVID related procedures or mandates. Um, as we know, this is an ever evolving process and we have not, districts in general, have not been able to update their policies as quickly as uh, they need to. Some policies are inconsistent with COVID matters and upper procedural matters. And there are some new policies that need to be created. Um, so we ask that you consider this tab this evening. Um, and as soon as we get information related to applicable updates, we of course will bring that to your attention. Um, we are also presenting a tab this evening for you to consider in regards to extending tax payments. Um, this resolution gives our citizens an opportunity to pay their taxes through April 30, I'm sorry, through August 31st without penalty or late fee. Um, and we're finding that this, uh, there are still some people still getting acclimated to this new process for processing taxes. And we wanted to make sure that uh, we were being fair and not charging people late fees for things that may be beyond their control. Um, so that tab is presented this evening also for your consideration. Um, I am also pleased to report that um, we shared with you previously that the um, Mount Vernon High School has been accepted into the IB organization. So we are official official. Uh, we paid the um, fees today. So we will get our IB banner and this is pivotal in terms of being able to move forward with our rebranding of Mount Vernon High School. This is a big piece to that uh, and a huge accomplishment. So I wanna salute uh, Ron Gonzalez as well as the team there um, for being able to move this forward to the point that we've been accepted organizationally. Um, and again, the notoriety and the esteem that comes with that designation as an IB school is huge for our community. A couple of other items I wanna share with you before we get to our update on the reopening plan. We've been working to actualize the directives given to the board to make budgetary reductions. We are about 90% there. Um, we have tried to capture as many of these reductions through attrition in order to minimize the impact on existing staff, especially now during such uncertain times. Uh, we've looked at program effectiveness and made decisions based on yield versus cost. Um, so that weighed into um, how we arrived at some of these, these proposed reductions. And tonight you're being asked on establishing, you're being asked to uh, act on establishing a Pell list, which is the preferred eligibility list, so that when we get on the other side of this, we will be able to recall people based on this list. So very specifically, the Pell list or the preferred eligibility list establishes the order in which people will be returned to work should we reinstate those positions at some point in the future. And it is based on seniority, it is based on law, and it is based on 
uh, date of hire, and in some instances, tenure area. Uh, so some of these reductions are related to some curriculum changes in the area of earth science specifically. And as we move toward a more rigorous uh, curriculum, we have made some changes that are, are actually quite timely based on what we are doing um, right now. So I'm gonna actually ask John, Dr. Jack Nandan to come in as part of my report and to begin to just kind of give you an update on we are, where we are relative to earth science. And while I don't he's- see him. I don't see him yet there, Dr. Hamilton. As soon as he gets there, I'm texting him right now. I'll bring him in. Oh, okay, great, thank you. Um, we are also looking at a partial reopening of the pool. So I know there are some pools that have been open, but they are primarily outdoor swimming pools. Um, and I'm reaching out to the Department of Health right now to see if we are able to offer some options to the public, however limited it may be, uh, just to try to generate some revenue um, for the pool to cover some of the maintenance costs right now. So as soon as I get more information about that, of course, I will update you and let you know where we are relative to our ability to open that, that pool in some capacity. It certainly won't be the way it's been previously, but anything that we can do, we will certainly um, try to do that in a manner that's consistent with guidelines put forth by the state and the Department of Health. Um, and we're going to go ahead, Jeff, then, and go to the- He's here. He's here, doctor. He's here, doctor. Oh, okay, great. So just to circle back, uh, we've made some curriculum changes on, in the area of science, um, particularly by eliminating earth science as we move to a more rigorous, rigorous curriculum across the district. And this is applicable in all three of our high schools. Dr. Chatish Jack Nandan is with us this evening, who oversees our science department and curriculum. Good evening, Dr. Jack Nandan. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Good evening. All is Good. well. How are you? So I was just explaining to the board, Dr. Jack Nandan, about um, the recommendation that went to the Ed Committee um, about changing the curriculum and accessing um, earth science from the curriculum and why we are doing that and the benefit it serves for our students. So if you could take it away from there. Absolutely. Um, so let me just give you guys some background on the direction the, the district is moving. We have uh, Nellie Thornton Performing Arts, and obviously their focus is the performing arts, but one of their mission is to make sure that every one of our students take an advanced placement course. That being said, um, to Mount Vernon STEAM, we have three pathways. We have engineering, we have computer science, and we also have a biomedical. And also at Mount Vernon High School, we have our International Baccalaureate Program. All three of those programs are requiring our students to have a rigorous curriculum in biology, chemistry, and physics before they enter their junior year. Obviously, chemistry and physics are the number two and number three predictors of college success. That's one of the reasons why we made the change to eliminate earth science, just so our students can have access in their freshman year and their sophomore year to chemistry and physics. Very important move to get out. Those are prerequisites for all the requirements at our three high schools. Number two, um, over the past two years, Earth Science has been one of the lowest performing Regents exams. Number three, our students' interest in that Earth Science course is not as high as other courses. So based on those three reasons alone, you know, um, the Ed Committee made the decision collectively to move away from Earth Science for the 2020-21 school year, just to make sure our students are actually prepared for all of those prerequisites and programmatic changes at the three high schools. So when I mentioned reference earlier um, about our decision to look at program effectiveness and cost versus yield, um, this was one of the programs that we looked at in anticipation of where we are. And again, uh, raising rigor in our, in our district to be more in line with some of our neighboring uh, districts who have made similar moves uh, in terms of course offerings at the high school level. And lastly, well, next to last, uh, we've provided an update for our uh, reopening plan. We've made a few changes. Dr. Hamilton? Yes, sir. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can I ask the teacher a question? Sure. Yes, absolutely. I just had a question. Um, when you say that the Earth Science Regents is one of the lowest performing, do you mean 
Mount Vernon students performed lowest on that test, or do you mean all people taking the regions performed lowest on that test? I didn't understand what you meant. A good question. Um, Mount Vernon City School District students over the past two years has been the lowest performing regions. And Can what do we have a sense of why that is compared to the um, other? Once again, yes, student interest is number one, the method methodology of how the course is constructed. So based on those two reasons, you know, teacher yeah. practice also, you know, that that's some of the reasons why it's been low, one of the lowest courses over the past few years. Question. I, I have a question. Go ahead. Oh, uh, so I, I don't know if anybody knows or the, the, the public is not aware that the the earth science regions is the easiest regions to take because it doesn't require a lab. And in New York City, a lot of eighth graders take the earth science mm -hmm. and take the earth science regions. Is there any possible way for the earth science um, classes to be, to be taken in eighth grade? So currently we do have a regions class being taken. Uh, we have living environment or biology being taken um, in our, all of our eighth grade students are actually enrolled in that particular course. Um, we just started that in the 2019-20 school year. So we're gonna continue that trend of all of our students taking earth science course in the, in grade eight. Okay. All right, that's a, that's, that's, that's a good, good answer. <laughs> I, have, I have a question. Yes, Darcy. Uh, what, what, I, what I've experienced with a lot of the students, and this is a small sample, um, but a lot of the students for STAR Scholars that um, the pass rate, the excelling rate, let's say, on the chemistry and physics regions has been pretty low. Um, so it's very rare that I see a student that comes in with an 80 or whatever yeah. where they... And so I'm just wondering, are we feeling that the introduction of these courses in their first year of high school is going to make a dramatic difference? So we'll be bringing them along in the curriculum? Absolutely. Um, you know, all of the research has shown that students taking the course is the number one indicator, number two and three indicators of college success. So I, I want to make this clear. You know, if we want our students to be informed with the International Baccalaureate Program, be ready for our advanced placement courses and be ready for those STEAM pathways. Taking these courses is the most crucial component. You know, sometimes we're always looking at performance, 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 but all of the research out there is really talking about giving our students access to these high level courses very early on. So when they do get to their junior and senior year, they're actually ready to embark on these high leverage courses that our universities and colleges are requiring. So in terms of 80 and above, not that many students in New York State are scoring the 80s and 90s and you know high 80s and high 90s on the chemistry and physics regions. It's mainly the opportunity to take these courses. And for the first time in Mount Vernon history, all of our students can pretty much take the the top three indicators of college success. We're talking about algebra two, we're talking about chemistry and physics before they graduate. How amazing is that? I it's mean, there's no time in Mount Vernon history that anyone can say that our students are taking those three courses before they graduate. And all the research have shown students taking those three courses before they graduate, they go to college and they are, they're almost 95% guaranteed to graduate college in four years. So if you're looking at all of these historical points, these data points, it just begs for us to move in that direction. President Miller. Yes. Uh, I would like to you know, have the, the um, district provide uh, the data about the success um, or the lack thereof of the children with the earth science because and I, and I want to discuss this further in executive session because it deals with staff. Um, but I'd like to see the data of the breakdown because my understanding is that Thornton High School and the STEAM school children have been doing well with the earth science. It is Mount Vernon High School um, not students where they, they, um, they're, they're struggling with that and I and as I said I want to speak to that more in executive session because it does deal with with staff. 
So I guess we should look at Satish, I guess if you could show us the data. The breakdown of the data, not just the sure. numbers of the success, but tell us where in these buildings, where these children are. Sure. Down Absolutely, I, I can give you guys um, some breakdowns right now for the past so we, two we, years. We'd like it in writing, please provide it to okay. us. We can, we can review it. If that's sure, no problem. Uh, Hamilton. I would just like to say one thing that we, the good news for Mount Vernon the good news here, folks, is that we do have a lot of students who are doing in the 80s and above in chemistry and physics. And those students, uh, we, have a, we have quite a, a good group of them. So we do have some very high performing students already. And I look forward to bringing the other students up and setting an example for our, uh, our neighboring districts. So um, another thing, as um, a parent of, um, had to think about the numbers, seven children that have gone through the district and, and some of them have gone through, you know, the, the um, sciences and the AP classes and so forth. So I know that the um, physics and chemistry, you know, are tough courses. So my concern also would be in reference to how will the district um, work with the e, um, ENL and special education children? because um, it just is what it is. Unfortunately, not all of our children are at that level or will be at that level. So how do we um, work with those children when these courses are regents bearing and for them to graduate? Absolutely. Um, you know, what we've done in the past and will continue to do, you know, we have our tutorial programs running from October all the way to May. So that's opportunities five days a week for our students to take advantage of those programs. As we get closer to the regents, we offer Saturday programs. So all of these tutorials, you know, um, will definitely help our students. Once again, I, I wanna stress the opportunity to take chemistry in regents and the, the chemistry and the physics, it's not all regents courses. Right. You know, there are some non-regents courses in both chemistry and physics. So it's for our students to take advantage of getting these courses early on to prepare them for those particular pathways, because the International Baccalaureate Program, the STEAM program, and also the Advanced Placement, we're looking for all of our students to take advantage of those, those pathways. And, so and, the, and, the, the, and the, 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 make a note of that, please. Thanks. All right. Thank you. But I just want I just wanted to add that the earth's again, the earth science does not require a lab. That's number one. So the earth science is very easy. So if you have individuals who are not passing the earth science, that's a portion, right? That's a that's a that's a red light right there. Well, and so and and you have a large portion of children that are able to take the earth science. It once again, it does not require a lab, right? So we're talking about the sun, moon, and rocks, stars, right? Um, and eighth graders can take the earth science with no problem, just like how they take the living environment. And so for them to take it ahead of time in eighth grade, so that that means that when they get to high school, their focuses is more so in like a career path journey, more so in a college preparatory journey, instead of quote unquote, wasting time doing the earth side. So really quickly, just, just some corrections. Um, New York State requires all three, all four chemistry, physics, earth science, and living environment, which is biology, to fulfill 20 hours of lab. Um, yeah. You know, for the earth science, they also require to take the practical exam. That's part of the regents. So that's the lab component of the regents exam. So if, if, okay, so then how, if, if earth science, now my sons are, they have learning disabilities. They said the earth science was the easiest thing for them to take. So if it's so easy for a child that has a disability and Brenda brought up the L's and individuals with disabled in Mount Vernon High School, individuals not doing well on the earth science, how is that? What's going on? But we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that when we get in the, uh, in the back room. Okay. All right. Okay. So can I say one last thing on this? Last last word. Um, I so I was actually a earth scientist. Um, so there are definitely career paths in earth science. Um, but 
I, I just want to, this is about money allocation and resources. That's all this is. No one is saying earth science is bad, or of course, earth science is awesome. There right. are great careers there and with biology and chemistry. Um, I would love to offer every possible science course to every possible high school or in our whole district. That'd be fantastic. That is not realistic. This is a time when we are taking a hard look at the programs and trying to bring efficiencies to our district where we can. And I understand everything uh, Satish just said. I understand the logic. I want earth science in our high schools, but I understand it, understand the logic. And I can, uh, I can say from experience that I agree with the, uh, the assessment and assumption that chemistry and biology success is a much better indicator of overall career success. Having taken two years of college chemistry and also two years of physical science, um, yeah, okay. it's, 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 uh, it makes sense and, and I understand what you're saying. And it's the lowest cost regions also, am I correct? Do you need like that much materials to teach earth science? Absolutely. You, you do. You do need materials to teach earth science just because of the lab based portion of the assessment and also conducting all the labs. So, you know, every single course requires if it's hands on and it's experimentation, you definitely require the district to spend to purchase those supplies. So I, I think that I think that there's a lot there's a lot to discuss. I think um, Cynthia in certainly in the education committee, I think there's a lot of rich conversation <clears throat> to be had here and some some learning for us to bring bring more of the trustees up to speed on this curriculum decision. But it seems like this decision is made for the fall, which I mean, school starts in six weeks, whatever form it is to take. It starts in six weeks. So let's uh, let's move on and, and um, keep this as a discussion point and keep talking about this over the next few months and see where see where we end up but um, I would echo what what uh, Mike trusted McOwen said that we are we are trying to optimize uh, our courses and we're also trying to have consistency across all three high schools that's a very very important um, element of our of our 2020 plan. So Dr. Hamilton, do you want to continue with your report? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, where did I leave off? Oh, the update on the reopening plan. Um, so we're showing you an update tonight that is a, a revision, just the revisions that show some of the changes that we were made to be that were made in order to be consistent with recent updates from the CDC. Um, NYSED or New York State Education Department also put out an FAQ. Um, so we looked at those frequently asked questions and tried to update our plan according to that. Um, we are literally getting information every day about this, this plan. So I wanna preface this with saying that this plan is flu fluid. There will be tons of questions that will arise Tomorrow evening, we'll be doing a Facebook Live to give parents an opportunity to hear the plan firsthand um, and to post questions on Facebook Live. Um, but there are going to be some questions we don't know how the answer to because the state is still changing um, some parameters based on reports from CDC about social distancing, about wearing masks and the efficiency and efficacy of wearing masks for younger children. Uh, and all sorts of things. So um, we're going to share the update with you this evening. And then following that, I would like to ask one of our trustees to make a motion to just accept this plan so that we can submit it to the state uh, this week as required. Um, and then we'll talk more in detail tomorrow on Facebook Live as we share the full plan with our public. Um, who's who's uh, got the share uh, window, Dr. Gorman or Rick? I do. Okay, you wanna do the share on the PowerPoint? Very good. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, just a couple of points before we dive into your questions or any any discussion on the reopening plan. Um, first, I want to let you know that um, over, since we've been working on this plan, it has truly been a collaborative effort between um, Mount Vernon Teacher Federation, Mount Vernon Administrators Association. Um, everybody has really pitched in at a really high level. Um, 
Dr. BC and myself have met with every group um, that you read about in the plan. And so this has been an evolving, um, very powerful movement. Um, fortunately and unfortunately, I think the real heavy lift is coming up, um, even though I've, we've been lifting really heavy for the last uh, couple of months. Um, but really now fine tuning all the details in each building and opening day procedures, putting together trainings, um, re-entry trainings, social distancing, um, curriculum units, um, all those heavy lifts um, we are actively working on every single day. Um, and literally we're open for business 24 seven on this. Um, and like Dr. Hamilton said, everything is evolving pretty rapidly. Um, so yesterday we sent home um, a draft version of the plan to everyone to look at. Um, I just want to point out some uh, some changes from the board presentation that we made on um, July 6th, which was uh, about 15 days ago, um, or 18 days ago. So the CDC um, is continuing to make um, ongoing changes on their recommendations. Um, and there's actually some uh, documentation in the in the plan that says when it's been updated. So uh, two weeks ago, we were ready to screen every child coming into school every day. And then the CDC changed their recommendation that says they do not recommend screening students on a daily basis for a number of reasons, psychological reasons. Um, they compared the flu, um, allergies and all those other things that kids may contract. And they noted that um, it might not be COVID. Uh, so they, they made some strong recommendations about not doing that. They did suggest a self-screening process to some extent. Um, and so we've already purchased or we're on the way to purchasing software to create a, um, an, an, a self-screening process for parents and students as we move on. In addition, we can do some um, on-site screening like we do at the Board of Education office um, where there is a nurse and, and, and an employee asking questions and taking temperature. Um, so we do have a plan for that when there is suspicion that kids might be sick or may have been in contact with others um, through contact tracing to the best of our ability. Um, we're also trying to uh, address the needs of staff and students with underlying medical conditions. Um, Dr. Hamilton, do you want to speak a little bit about your, um, your outreach yes. to staff? So um, after consultation with, with council and looking at plans from across the, the country and just trying to bid, pull best practices, and I have to say there are some districts in our immediate area who haven't gone to this level but I've asked staff to begin to identify um, with documentation if they have some pre-existing conditions that may impede their ability to return to work. I've been very clear about our expectation that all staff will return full time in September. Um, however, we need to make appropriate plans. And if we are gonna have a large number of staff members who have pre-existing conditions who will need appropriate accommodations, we need the opportunity to plan for that. Um, so I've asked staff to indicate to me directly, not through HR or, or any of the support people, um, just so that we can make certain that we are uh, honoring HIPAA, HIPAA laws. Um, so staff members have been asked to communicate to me by August 1st, if they have an underlying medical condition that has been documented so that we can explore um, possible accommodations for these staff people or assign them specifically to uh, be our home distance, our distance learning instructors to the extent that there's a sufficient number of folks who need such accommodations. I will keep you up to date on that as the data comes in, but the deadline for submitting that is August 1st. So one of the common themes that um, we've been talking about for the last, uh, since March of last year is that this is a time to transform um, instruction, a chance that we probably will never get it uh, an opportunity to do in, in our lifetimes or careers and and such we are taking advantage of that fully um, I was on a um, an ISTE webinar today and they were talking about Gen Z or Gen Z mm -hmm. kids and how their attention span to video is a minute and they talked about the TikTok kids and and videos under six minutes and how different these learners are compared to when we 
went to school um, and they did a nice comparison. I'll pass that video on if anybody wants that at another time. Um, but having said that, we've had really good conversations about creating weekly units of studies for kids um, in a backward design. It's called Understanding by Design, UBD, and tying it into differentiated instruction. Um, Dr. Hamilton has spoke about flipping the classroom and really engaging and using the technology tools. Now, in the, from March to June, we really, it was a time for exploration and learning. It'll be continue to be a time for learning. Um, our PD uh, commitment has been tremendous and continues to be um, a foundation for us moving along. But we are now um, really trying to ramp it up. So um, we have entered, with, we're in conversations with ASCD, which is the Association for Curriculum Development um, throughout, you know, the most powerful organization that's at least that Dr. Hamilton and I are aware of for curriculum development and instruction um, to work with some designated teachers on different grade levels and different content areas to start creating model units for, um, for teachers to consume. And then we're going to work with our staff to continue to develop these units of study. And that is a huge shift, a huge paradigm shift for for Mount Vernon in comparing to daily lessons and following a program versus really delving into um, higher levels of learning, um, creating and sharing content, um, navigating, engaging video uh, where kids are and, and taking them to a higher level of learning um, while also maintaining essential skills because that's a really important component never to forget about condensing into using power standards and, and we feel that this is an, a, an opportunity we just can't um, take advantage of. So unlike some districts that we've been talking to and having conversations, they're trying to replicate what they were doing in a virtual environment. And we're, we are doing that and really taking these weekly units to another level, which we hope will yield um, academic, um, social, emotional results, um, higher levels of interest in learning and really, um, and really take um, our education, our children's educations to where we know um, they need to be taken. Um, we've made a commitment to spe special education students and L's and pre-K four to um, bring them in four days a week, um, maintaining social distancing and, and safety precautions because we know those kids um, need extra and so they should get extra and that is uh, part of our discussions on equity and equality in the district. Um, along with federal and state regulations as well, and compliance issues. Um, we added uh, a concept of a virtual teacher help desk. So when teachers are working with half of their kids, um, the, the students are working on other synchronous or asynchronous activities, um, other collaborating with students, watching teacher videos and, and involved in other types of activities like physical education virtually um, and, and other things in other content areas. Um, well, we want them to have access to a teacher regardless um, when the teacher is busy working with half of the student population. So we believe that through what Dr. Hamilton talked about with um, teachers with underlying medical conditions that we could utilize them in, in a capacity that will help support the overall plan, instructional plan in the district. Um, our professional development highlights, I, I mentioned to you a little bit about uh, working with a cadre of teachers, doing that in the summer coming to you um, and starting that work in a couple of weeks. Uh, Dr. Hamilton mentioned the suspension of policies, which was a different, uh, a different spin on things than it was about three weeks ago. And it basically says that the reopening policies supersede regular policies in this time of, uh, of, um, of the pandemic. And it allows us to adjust. We'll continue to look at all of our policies like attendance throughout the school year. Uh, but there are, um, in order to shift to this mode of learning, there are enormous, con there are lots of, not enormous, but there are, are regular contradictions to our regular policy um, that the reopening has to supersede at this point. And that's a common practice we're seeing across the states as well. Um, and according to the survey that we had put out that closed today, um, and, and it was, um, um, we have over 7,500 kids. So uh, the, at about 2,000, Approximately 50% would like to engage in full virtual learning come September. Um, I think national trends are about 60-40 uh, on that trend. So we're fairly consistent with that. And our next steps will be to survey parents and kids on whether they plan on coming to school or planning on receiving a remote um, education in September. 
Hold on, let me continue. So um, action steps that are, are ahead of us and are immediate after tonight. So the, the process is after the board accepts the plan, we then um, have to put a statement of assurances to the State Department and put the links to the plans that you guys looked at yesterday um, on the website and on each school site. And so what will happen is that each school site's plan will evolve. It will take the foundation of our plan and then it will add components that are unique to that school. Uh, and as we are starting to see, the information is changing daily, hourly. Um, and, you know, I know the governor had mentioned the first week of August making decisions on school. So I'm sure it will continue to change and we'll continue to update our documents. Uh, we're, we're, we're waiting. We're, while we're working very hard, we know how important communication is. And so tomorrow, like Dr. Hamilton said, um, is our, we're kicking off our campaign to communicate to all stakeholders once our plan was basically approved at this level. Um, we plan on working with a summer administrators workshop for our administrators on the concepts that I had mentioned a couple of, a couple of minutes ago. Um, and we want to continue to survey parents and that'll happen next week on if they want to come back to school and if they prefer the Monday and Tuesday and Thursday, Friday schedules, um, the deadline for that to ha to notify parents tentatively as we speak right now is August 14th. Um, the survey will go out. We'll start next week and we'll close next Friday, and that'll give us a week to coordinate efforts and see um, how all these moving parts come together. Um, we also want to the, the process. I'm sorry, Dr. Gorman. The process we we've used to create this plan. I'm so proud of it because we've involved uh, so many various stakeholders in it, and Jeff and Dr. Gorman and I have been able to uh, gather this information by him working directly with stakeholders here and me working with stakeholders across the state and then bringing this information back together to synthesize what I think is a very solid plan. Um, and we've been working very, very closely with uh, taking information that we think is applicable to our district, our community and the needs of our students and our staff and combining that with information that we've we've garnered from these, these other entities and trying to get as many voices in it as possible. Um, now, frankly, we have probably over communicated this uh, to, in terms of our, our stakeholders and tried to capture all these different voices. But at the end of the day, our parents will need this information in order to make appropriate decisions. And I think we should understand that while we've put all of this effort into creating this plan, um, to one, reflect the needs of our community, and two, to comply with state um, directives and expectations, we could still end up in a completely virtual environment based on what some other communities are experiencing around the state, around the country, as this, as this gets closer to um, fall, fall dates, or be in the midst of this very well-executed plan and have to shift gears because data starts to change in terms of trends. And I'll articulate this uh, again tomorrow evening when we're talking directly with our, with our parent community and our student community. Um, but I can't emphasize enough how dynamic this process is in terms of the various pieces associated with it and how flexible we all have to be in, in terms of recognizing that it could shift. Yep. So as, as we continue, we're going to start a parent training um, within, hopefully, within a week. Uh, we're working with building administration. So tomorrow, as soon as this phase goes, I will reach out to principals and start setting up scheduling meetings to see what these building routines and schedules look like for each school. Um, central office has been working together in different aspects to say, okay, these are the policies we and procedures we have district-wide that all schools have to follow. The technology department is on beyond overload with their work to now, you know, I can't say this enough. We're taking a district where we began to introduce a one-to-one -one at one school of 250 kids. And now we are moving to a one-to-one -one for over 7,000. That does not happen in a six month period anywhere. Um, and that is probably one of the, the neatest things for us in, 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 um, 
closing that digital divide that we started to really see signs that it really exists. And through a normal process, we probably wouldn't get there for quite some time, but that's we are true. going there in September and that's really exciting. That is a huge accomplishment. There are districts um, with resources, um, with extensive resources that haven't been able to uh, come out and say that they are ready to move to a one-to-one -on, uh, one -one, um, device in, in, their, in their district, particularly a district of our size. So I really have to thank uh, the Mount, Mount Vernon Ed Foundation for their support with that. That was a huge help. Um, the Office of School Improvement, Dr. BC, she's been scraping and scrounging and coming up with funds to make that, that happen. Um, and I am just so proud of the fact that we really are able to do that. And we've, we've really looked very closely at how we were allocating uh, funds on textbooks and paper material, paper generated materials in this environment right now and reallocated some of those funds to be able to move to this one-to-one -one, uh, environment for, for yeah. our students. So I'm extremely excited yeah. about that. And Dr. Hamilton, and that's that's sort of where we were, where I was talking before. It would be a contradiction for us to go back and do the same thing through a computer instead of giving the computer and going to higher levels of learning. It, it would be sort of, okay, now we just substituted a computer and you could do the worksheets there. Mm -hmm. um, and so this opportunity is really great for us to take hold of um, and, and take it to the next level. So um, Dr. In addition, Gorman? Yep. Dr. Gorman, so that so so hence the uh, the the uh, the new format, the new the new units of study, all of that, because there's there's no going back. There's only going forward. That's right. So. That's right. A hundred percent, President Miller, and and regardless, even if we're back in school full time, I think these units are going to be a mainstay in our district now leveraging the technology that way. Um, we're cutting it close, so we don't have many repairs or extras. Um, and we're gonna continue to keep out, keep seeking um, funding formulas to do that. We're also working on uh, Wi-Fi protocols and partners with that. We have over 150 right now, my, MIFI devices they're called, um, which are portable hotspots. And we're looking at other partnerships right now to expand that and the cost of that as well. Um, a couple of things that are a couple. And Before I'm, you go on, Jeff, let me just say in. something on, on yep. that. Um, I will also be presenting a reorganization plan to the board in our technology department because our needs have changed drastically. Um, so reallocating uh, support so that we can get devices re repaired, that we can monitor our inventory that we have an online support system for parents and staff members and teachers um, and, and parents, staff and students uh, who will need that support. So the way our technology department is structured right now is not conducive to where, where we're going. Um, so I will be presenting a reorg plan to you very soon about how we wanna restructure that department so that it matches the environment that we are moving in. Okay. Um, and here are two big ones for consideration. I think the second one is is very doable. So one of our team members, Ms. Diggs, actually came to me yesterday and said, you know, I have friends in Georgia and other parts of the country, and they're all coming to, they're all bringing their, their front loading all of their professional development to give the teachers and the schools plan to really get into this reentry plan, reentry training, the training, social distancing, how to set up classrooms, um, how to how to move around, who goes where when, um, the planning of the units, the loading it up on Schoology, the distribution of laptops, all, all that preparation and planning is, is, I can't do it justice in words here. So we are seriously considering taking our year long conference days and lumping them in the beginning of the year to give us some time to really um, to prepare and plan because we can't bring the staff in two weeks earlier the entire staff two weeks earlier we could bring in some of the curriculum writing hopefully but um but it, this would give us time to really leverage and do it right and i think that's a growing sentiment um and, and sounds like a very uh strong plan so we'll give you a final verbiage on that as we move forward the other thing we talked about which really would make the world uh, much better for us is if there was any way the school district could be a testing site for COVID-19. And I don't know what that 
um, looks like or feels like yet. But part of the reentry to school is that you have to have two tests spaced out over 24 hours a day in order to reenter if you contract COVID-19. That's going to be really challenging for parents to go out and get those tests. Um, and if we have suspicion of staff or students that might um, have contracted the, the virus, it would be great if we had the mechanism internally to provide testing and get results uh, within a short amount of time. I don't know what the likelihood of that is, but it is something that Dr. Ma, um, our, our district doctor, and uh, other parts of our team are looking into. That, to me, would be a game changer for us. Could we I have also, with, mm. I'm sorry, Madam President, go ahead. No, I was going to say, could we partner with a, uh, a local hospital or, you know, medical facility to, uh, to uh, achieve that in school? Um, I'm actually reaching out to the Department of Health and seeing what that would look like for us, what protocols we need to have in place um, and figure out the costs associated with that. I'll also be reaching out to the mayor because uh, I know she also has um, provided some testing sites in the city that we may be able to partner on. So we'll be, we'll be looking at that. Um, I had a meeting yesterday with the uh, outgoing commissioner uh, Commissioner Tahoe, and I've at, I asked her um, about the 180-day requirement because as the change in leadership happens, we want to make certain that uh, some of the things that we've put in place based on decisions made by the current administration be carried over into uh, this interim uh, or acting um, administration. So I anticipate that she will be making that commitment for us so that if we do front load our PD, we will still meet our 180 day requirement. So that information is, is still forth, forthcoming. There's actually a definition in our reopening plan about a unit of study and it talks about 180 minutes of instruction, a combination of blended um, and, and um, technical training and in, in direct instruction. So it defines itself in there. And I do believe that if we produce those units, we would hit those mandates as well. Okay. Um, that's a great plan. I would just like to, to quickly say, and then if there are any questions, um, you know, I know everyone is very, I'm well aware that everyone is very frustrated and anxious. Um, it, it's, it's not just us in Mount Vernon, it's all over the country. Um, but, and the lack of clarity is, is very difficult for a society such as ours. Um, but I think that what we see here in, in the planning that's taken place and, and in, in the execution, the ability to pivot that we uh, demonstrated in March when we had maybe two days of PD and then we were doing remote learning on March 17th or 18th. Um, I, think, I think that we should take some, and the community should take some solace in that. We do have a, a, a very forward looking plan here. And I think it will ultimately, you know, when we know what we're doing, and once again, we have to wait another couple of weeks to be able to make a definitive uh, uh, commitment to parents uh, and teachers. But um, I, I believe that we're going forward in a way that is better than what we've been doing in the past. I think we are in a much better position to guarantee to the community that we're delivering equity in all our buildings, these units of study, really take away, in my mind, if I have this right, not being an educator, but they take away any questions about, you know, is my student getting the same uh, instruction at this school as the other students getting at that school? And this to me is, is a huge, huge, and this and the one-to-one -one, uh, aspect is a huge, um, move to equity. And it's just, it's a very, to me, it's a very exciting platform. So I, I think if we stick together, if we work together as a community and we, we accept the fact that we're frustrated and we're anxious and we're gonna constantly have questions and accept the fact that we're not always gonna have clear answers and that to Dr. Hamilton's point, at any given moment, if the case numbers go up, we may have to go, you know, back into, into virtual, 100% virtual, but we're prepared for that. And we will try to find supports for our parents um, as, as you know, anything we can do to try to help 
ease the, the pain of, of these constant changings, uh, changes, but I think it's the new way of life for us and we just need to stick together and I think we'll get through this very successfully. And I'm very, very proud of the administration and the work they've done. I think we're in excellent hands. And I think it just, maybe the silver lining of this virus for us in terms of Mount Vernon City School District is that we are moving to a whole new level of educating our students that I think will be extremely successful. And I really look forward to seeing the results. Yes. Anybody Thank have you. any questions? Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Micah, Trustee McGowan. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I echo everything you said. I think there's, you know, the, this, the district has never faced a bigger pot of lemons and, and you're really doing everything we can possibly do to make lemonade out of it. Um, I think it's, it's throughout this whole pandemic, I've never heard from anyone in administration what I would consider a complaint. Uh, I mean, there's lots of frustration and, and, and difficulties but uh, the attitude has been from the very beginning, okay, how do we meet this challenge and how do we come out the other end even better than we started uh, to the summer camp. So kudos to everybody. I had a question, um, and again, to echo what Trustee Miller said, it's <clears throat> all we can do and all this crazy changes every day and, and the, the crazy anxiousness that we all feel and that you know, every day in the newspaper, there's another op-ed about what school district should be doing um, thank you very much for all your opinions, you know, media. <laughs> but um, I, I mean, all this effort, I hope will end up paying off in that once the school year actually finally starts, finally, uh, that it will be relatively smooth and consistent, right? That's what all this work, this hard work is going towards so that the buildings, each building knows what is going to happen, when there's a case, this is what we're going to do. Right, because even regardless of what we do in the school buildings, just statistically, people in the district will contract the virus, right? We know that we already have, and they will continue to, no matter what we do. That's just a fact of life. Um, but having these protocols in place in advance should, once the, once the dust finally settles from Albany and the feds and everything, we can hopefully move forward with some guidance. Sorry, anyway, my one question is in the, in the plan, uh, you, there's a mention of staggered um, departure and arrival times with no details at all. And I understand obviously the details vary from building to building and grade to grade, but can you talk a little bit more about what, what that really looks like? And are you talking about staggering over the course of like 30 minutes or two hours or like, what are we talking about? Um, so uh, the conversations have emerged from um, the principal and the administrative representatives on the task force. Um, specifically with some of the older kids, bringing them in the eighth graders, um, seventh and eighth graders, dismissing them in arrival times differently than the little ones. Um, but I think one of the important things that we have to flush out is how many points of entry do we have? Um, and how many people do we have to support those points of entry in a safe manner? So a school might have three entrances that they want to use versus one that has one entrance that they might want to use. And so staggering, we did not build in a protocol, but we think it's a consideration to maintain social distancing and, and decorum. Um, but, you know, as, as we're, as we're looking at these numbers, so what if 50% of our kids decide to stay home and then 50% of the 50% are coming in, we might not have a need to stagger. We might be perfectly fine with space. Right. Uh, so, so that is a consideration that will be flushed out in the next two or three weeks. My other question is about um, food service and meals. Um, two questions. First is for the students that are in the building, it, what, what will it look like? Would it look like something like individually wrapped lunches that people take or something? And then my second question is for the students that are not in the building, or we, we're feeding each day, we need to feed students physically in the building and also students not physically in the building, right? So we're gonna have both considerations. That is actually one of the requirements um, from the state that food service must continue for students that are in school as well as those students who are not in physically in school. So there will be individually packaged lunches that will be served in classrooms for students. And for those students who are in a remote learning or distance learning um, format, 
lunches will be provided for them to be able to come and pick up as we did um, throughout the March through June period. Um, similar to what Dr. Hamilton is saying, um, little kids, middle kids, and older kids eat lunch differently. So there are going to be different practices and protocols um, based on the school environment. Uh, the great news is that the food service team put together a, a multi-layered process because they're working obviously with other school districts as well. Um, and they shared that. And now the next step will be to, again, work with the building administration and what is the workflow or what is the food flow uh, for it. Um, we're going to try to, uh, with our partnerships and our and collaboration with the, with the um, teachers union and, and the administrators union, we're looking at doing things out of the box. So uh, maybe somebody can wheel a cart to a classroom for us at a certain time. Um, and, but the big shift, um, Trustee McGowan, was moving from hot buffet food to cold food. Um, and called packaged food. And that, that wasn't a, a decision we made easily, um, but there are so many potential exposures to spreading um, the viruses. I mean, you can't find, there are no more buffets in, in the world. <laughs> they have on salad bars, they've, they're out of business. Um, all those buffet style. So we're going on line with recommendations. Any other questions? I have a question. I know we have been, um, we've been housing the um, students with uh, parents who have essential, essential workers. Will we continue to have those students five days a week? Great, great question. Yes, we will. We are still required to provide care for essential workers. We may, depending on space, we may need to do that with one of our CBOs, but that's why this data is so important so that we get a sense of how many kids will be in our buildings and how many teachers will be in our buildings because we may be able to designate a gym for example for that purpose or we may be able to designate the library for example in some of our buildings we may be able to designate a south and north side facility for parents to make it easier for them to drop kids off if they are essential workers and they need that service. So the direct answer to your question is our, we've thought about that and our intent is to be able to provide that in district, but we are also understanding that if we are at capacity and we have to provide this space, and I honestly don't see space being an issue if the truth be told, but um, we do have uh, opportunities with our CBOs so we'll be able to do that if we need to, but that would be a last resort. And then uh, what's the definition of essential workers? Because, you know, you have people that, you know, you have the uh, police officers, the nurses, but right. you know, the supermarket workers, I yep. mean, essential, you know, like. It's a very broad, uh, broad definition. It includes, obviously, your frontline workers like police, fire, EMS, um, nurses, doctors, those in the medical profession, but it also includes delivery people who are associated with transportation of goods, Amazon delivery people, uh, anybody who operates a trucking company, for instance, required uh, to help transport and, and keep products moving from coast to coast. Uh, it includes cashiers, as supermarkets are considered uh, essential functions. Uh, so it is a very broad definition. Uh, in terms of Mount Vernon, our employees, the superintendent can designate who our essential workers are uh, based on the needs of our district and how we need to operate. But the state provides parameters and then more specifically districts provide parameters for its employees as well. In addition to those definitions I just shared. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hamilton. Uh, hey, how you doing Trustee White? I'm fine. I know we talked about um, the staff that might have some underlying issues. How about the staff that either have children that have the underlying issues or children or parents, I mean, teachers or staff that have little children, like infants or something, have they been considered? We have started look to look at people who have, uh, who care for elderly parents, for instance, right. or who have childcare issues and at some point we will have to draw the line um, and some people may have to take family uh, FMLA 
because there are some things that we just cannot make accommodations for. Um, but we are looking at that data and folks have started communicating that to me. There are some people who have started sharing that while they may not have a direct um, pre-existing condition, they have concerns about bringing potential germs home to people right. that they care for who do. So we're looking at that and that'll be our next layer. Um, I really want to try to make sure we make as many accommodations for people as possible. Um, we've got budget reductions going on. We've got COVID going on. We've got uh, significant health issues going on. So we want to try to make sure that we keep our community as healthy as possible. And I'm not just talking about your physical health. I'm talking about your emotional right. wellness, your financial wellness, your spiritual wellness, all those things that we can control we will try to make provisions to do so. Now, when we have Crump, staff. I want, Trustee Crump has a question, Trustee White. She's been waiting. You're on mute. Trustee White, White. White. Trustee White, White can finish and then I'll go after her. Okay, you wanna well, finish? Well, we have finished her questions and thoughts. Thank you, Trust President. The, um, due to the fact that a lot of our students have lost grandparents and parents do, um, for the COVID, will we have mental health on board, on staff to deal with some of these children that will be coming through? Exactly. Part of what Wednesdays will be designated for is social emotional wellness. Uh, so we will be doing, teachers will be doing check-ins with students. Uh, counselors, of course, will be available to assist students who have experiences that they need to help process, we need to help process. Um, and of course, those services will be doubled to the extent that we can with existing staff because of the availability of staff on this designated day on Wednesday. Okay, thank well, Dr. you. B, I know Dr. BC and um, her department was a big part of the mental health and social and emotional learning component in the plan, as well mm -hmm. as the Office of uh, of special education and, and, and Rachel DePaul as well. Um, it's a big part of our plan um, and it should be integrated and we need to provide resources to families and to students on mental health and how to even assess if, if someone is, is, is not is struggling um, in, in this environment. So that's something we are going to make a big push on um, as well as everything else. Thank you. Okay, so I, yeah, thank you. My questions um, are in regards to the building air um, filtration and then um, plastic shields for the teacher's desk like they have in the grocery stores, hair salons, et cetera, other um, establishments. I didn't hear anything about that. <coughs> Excuse me. We have not made the investment into shields. We looked at um, what they would cost and they are, are quite expensive to put the individual partitions on students' desks. Um, we have not looked at partitions on teachers' desks because we really want to discourage teachers from sitting at their desks when they're actively engaged in instruction and have them um, working directly with kids and moving around the classroom. So we have not um, put any protocols in place for uh, teachers to shield themselves at their at their desks. Okay, the recommendations, um, Trustee Crump, is our, our recommendation is that we are going to mandate um, masks for all except for medical exemptions. Those medical exemptions accommodations, we might use protocols like you're suggesting for those students and for the teachers, because it talks about accommodations and accommodations doesn't mean necessarily that you just work from home. It means that possibly a partition place might be available for someone that might be semi-vulnerable. Um, so we have to work individually with, with the conditions of our students and our staff, but the commitment to mask um, versus not to mask was the big decision that we made in our district. Um, some districts have used, put that lower down on their priority. Um, we said that, that we expect everyone to wear a mask. Um, and they even made recommendations in the CDC that even if you, um, if you wanna use the protective gear, you should have a mask on underneath the protective gear. Um, so we, we made a commitment to mask wearing for our district. And so the question for air filtration. So there is air filtration in our buildings. Um, most of our buildings, if not all, and Michael Policio isn't with us tonight, he's on vacation, um, but we've updated the, um, what are they called? 
It's the Merv filters, and I think he did a whole piece at our last yeah. board meeting. Yeah. Um, it, it's not possible to get to see Univentilators. Levels. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, Univentilators have been updated, and all of our classrooms right. filters have all been updated. Um, the Buildings and Grounds Committee did a presentation on that a, a while ago. So I think we're in a pretty good space in terms of making sure that there is quality <laughs> air circulating in the class, in all classrooms. Two more things. I think um, given the current situation that we're under and people's concern about the air, so since that presentation was given a while ago, I think it would be good to probably, you know, give that again to ease people's minds, um, you know, coming into the building. And secondly, on the resolutions you have listed about um, two counselors that you'll be removing. So dealing with the mental health, where will those counselors um, be re removed from? And how will, um, what supports or whatever will be put in to, for that place, dealing with the mental health, um, emotional piece that we were just talking about with the children? So those positions have not been hired. The, I have those, those were new positions that were put in the budget when we access attendance teachers. So they are not uh, people that are currently in our structure. They would have been assigned to central office if we had proceeded with the budget as presented to the board. Um, those two counseling positions would be designated at central office as part of the attendance monitoring re responsibilities. On, on OLAS, there's a, there's a, um, a position in regards to counselors. Is that something old or? Um, I'm not entirely sure which, which posting that is, to be honest with you. Um, I can find out from Mrs. Ms. Tiggs uh, if that's an existing position or an old, an old uh, posting. Yeah. But, and then as for your conversation, you said that the preferred, the preferred list when those two individuals, when that position is needed, those are the two that would be called. That is correct. Oh. If they're on the Pell list, they would be recalled in the order that they appear on that list. Thank you. You're welcome. We good? All right. I have yeah. some questions for tomorrow night when we have, when we discuss school opening. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Um, Madam President, can I ask um, for a, a motion to accept the plan yes uh we'd like a mo can i have a motion to accept the plan as it exists today <laughs> uh, motion. So, that we can, so that we can move forward motion from miss white thank you second thank you all in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed abstain motion carries um, and the last item, thank you all very much for that. And the last item on my superintendent's report, um, I'm going to ask Mr. Babiello, um, Rick, if you could bring Mr. Babiello in uh, just to kind of give a, an overview of change orders that appear on tonight's agenda. Thank I know you've you. had a chance to read them in advance, but um, if Mr. Babiello can respond to any questions, um, this would be a great opportunity to do that. Dr. Hamilton, you, you cut out while I was getting synced in. Um, you were asking for questions uh, on the change orders? Yes, if you could just uh, go through the change orders that are on the agenda for this evening and answer any questions that trustees may have related to them. Sure, not a problem. Um, we had, I believe, nine on the agenda, but about half of them are actually credits, which is great. Yep. Um, EC number two was with Talt Electric at Mandela. Um, for, for, I'm sorry, was there a question? No, no, no I just think you're hearing background noise. Okay. Uh, for $4,000, this was actually, um, electrical upgrade work that was required by our elevator vendor, Kone, that does all our district, uh, site inspections and service work, um, at Mandela. And they requested, um, new electrical panel and disconnect be installed. Uh, PC04 was for TWP plumbing, <clears throat> excuse me, also at Mandela for 7,000. This was at the nurse's office, which was um, to be used in kind as part of our uh, value engineering during the rebid effort. 
um, but we later decided that we should provide an additional hand sink in the lobby area of the nurse's suite um, to be consistent with what we're doing at some of the other buildings. Uh, the next one was GC06 for Barrett Roofs at the STEAM Academy. This is actually a credit for $1,500 uh, for unused allowances on the project. The next one was EC2 for RLJ Electric, also at the STEAM Academy. Uh, this was 16,000 and this was for um, upgrades to tie-ins to the new fire alarm system for spaces that were uh, developed separately from this bond project in the lower level um, to provide spaces in the buildings for particular programs. But the work didn't quite coincide at the same time as the bond project work. So this tie-in to the new fire alarm system that was provided as part of the bond project had to happen separately after the fact. So this brings the fire alarm tie-ins and updated emergency lighting to those spaces. The next one is also at Mount Vernon Steam Academy for RLJ Electric for uh, just under $1,000. Um, and this was to hardwire um, some of the new um, engineering lab tables in one of the new renovated lab spaces that we had. Um, the scope to make that connection for this particular equipment wasn't captured in the construction documents. So we had to, <clears throat> we got a proposal for them to make that connection. The next one is also for Mount Vernon Steam Academy. It's actually a credit, uh, again, for unused project allowance dollars, um, about $350 for the masonry contractor. The next one is at Mandela GC60 for Piazza Construction. Uh, 21,000 is for site work. And there was actually multiple components to this. There was a run of existing fencing um, where the proposed basketball court is going to be located that had to be demoed. There was a couple existing trees that had to be removed and stumps and that portion then needed to have new new fencing installed um, consistent with the, the rest of the site perimeter fencing that we're calling for. Um, this scope uh, wasn't clearly identified in the construction documents. It otherwise would have been a cost included in the overall bid. The next one is for the STEAM Academy GC20 for renewed contracting, again, as a credit um, this was to cover the cost of custodial overtime that the contractor requested um, for second shift work. The next one is PC6 at the STEAM Academy for TWP Plumbing for uh, just under 10000 And this scope included providing and installing um, 11 plumbing mixing valves for the new sinks and eyewash stations in the renovated uh, classrooms. Um, the construction documents did not specify the particular product needed. Um, so this was clarified and the contractor was asked to procure that, um, that material and provide the installation. And the last one is at uh, Thornton for Niram Construction for $2,000. And this was related to site work where when they were prepping for the paving that was recently completed for the new parking area, they found that one of the existing or two of the existing sections of drainage pipes for the stormwater were found to be crushed in the ground. So we had them remove the crushed sections and replace them with new, new piping prior to performing the new asphalt work so that we don't have a problem with stormwater runoff. And that concludes the change orders. Does anyone have any questions regarding these change orders? Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ken. You're welcome. Um, let me just go back to my notes real quick. Five positions were cut, new positions, and two were let go. Um, 
I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna need to clarify that counselors uh, those two positions that was referenced a minute ago. I just need to get a little more information. I just got a, a text message I need to, to to digest, but I'll bring that back to you a little later. Um, that concludes the superintendent's report. Yes, that concludes my report at this time. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> an update on committees. First, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, thank uh, the trustees that have raised their hands uh, to get involved with some of our committees. Uh, committee work is essential to keeping the board up to date without everyone having to know everything. And we rely on our committee members to become a little bit of experts in, in their area. And we try to match um, generally expertise with task at hand. So um, I'm, I'm very pleased that uh, we have uh, a, a full complement of committee people. Um, so we'll be uh, releasing, I'll be giving the, the final list to uh, Mr. McCormick and we'll uh, share it. Um, but basically policy, Micah McGowan uh, is still handling policy audit I'm taking. Um, I did have a meeting with Ken Silver. I can talk about that or not. Uh, budget is Melissa Munoz Patterson. Curriculum instruction is Cynthia Turnquest Jones. Strategic planning is Adrian Saunders and myself. Buildings and grounds will be co-chaired by Brenda Crump and Wanda White. Parent and community relations. We've got uh, Cynthia Turnquest Jones has raised her hand and I know um, Trustee Red is considering that. Yeah, I'm, yeah. In. I'm in. You're in. Okay, so Trustee Red is in as well on parent and community relations or family and community engagement, whatever we want to acronym we want to come up with that. Working with Dr. Bennett Conroy and the parent liaisons, and then health and wellness and safety. Um, Vice President Saunders, what which part of that is Trustee Mitchell taking? Um, I think he's going to take health and well health and wellness. Is that correct, is, Mr. Mitchell? Okay. Yes, that's correct. We discuss health and safety and health and uh, wellness. Okay, so you're going to do health and wellness. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Trustee Saunders, you still have um, special ed. Special ed, health and safe, health and um, safety, and um, strategic planning, and right. also the counselors. Okay. So um, now can my question, can we be a part of other committees? Yes. Yeah. As long as we don't have a, a we just can't have a quorum. So anyone can, you know, we will, we will make um, committee meeting times uh, available to all trustees. And then I'm I'm just going to be asking the the committee chairs to share their reports both in a you know a, a, a oral format but also in a written format so that every couple of weeks um, we all get to become a little bit smarter about initiatives that are uh, underway in individual areas. So I will I will um, I'll draw up some guidelines for that, but yes, uh, the more the merrier. And it's just, and we also have, we also have community members, um, all of our um, committees, except for, I guess they're all open. Um, so we have community members who participate as well in some of these committees. As long as we don't have more than, um, really not to make it, we don't make it too unwieldy, but two or three board members in a, in a committee meeting, it's fine. And, and technically the cutoff is five, but I think just to keep it, to keep things flowing and to keep them on time. And then committees will, you know, uh, you need to establish with your um, administrative liaison what time works for you and come to agreement on the time. But it would be great if we could get committees going at least on a monthly basis. I know that budget uh, meets on a more frequent basis and given the times we're in, that makes sense. But uh, the, the meeting frequency will ebb and flow, but minimally once a month. Okay. Um, one, one more question. I was just listening to the plan and everything, which I think is cool, but will the children have all the resources they need 
coming into the school year as far as computers and Wi-Fi and that sort of thing? They will actually have more than they've had historically. Um, so yes, every student will have a device. Um, we are gathering information now to determine how many of our parents will need some form of Wi-Fi access. Um, so we will either provide hotspots or continue our partnerships with some of the service providers to provide complimentary services to our parents. So between uh, one of those two options, we should be able to say confidently that everyone will be able to have access by way of uh, some form of, of Wi-Fi. But again, that's why we have to collect the data by way of the survey uh, to make sure that we have an accurate account of folks. And we understand that if you don't have Wi-Fi, you can't very well complete the survey. So once we get that information, we will, those we have not heard from, we will mail them a paper uh, survey that they can complete and return to us. Okay. Um, um, just for clarity, Madam President, if I can, hmm. on the counselors, the two positions that were reduced, uh, there were a couple of schools who had more than one counselor. Uh, some of the elementaries had a 1.5. So there were four schools in particular who had a 0.5. So those positions have been reduced to 1.0. So there is, in fact, two counseling positions that were reduced. In 2014, we had 18 counselors and we now have 27. Um, so Dr. Smith just gave me clarity on that. So that we would be That's clear great. on those, those number of reductions. Great. Okay, so I think if there's, if does anyone uh, have a, a report from a committee or anything they'd like to share briefly before we get to the uh, agenda? Okay. Um, I do. Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, just real briefly, uh, from a policy perspective, just to um, both Dr. Hamilton and Dr. Warman touched on this with the new the proposed basically one sentence um, policy or policy override about the COVID measures. Uh, we did take a look through um, a pretty comprehensive look through the policies when the pandemic first started. And then we took another look at the beginning of the summer and nothing at that stage leapt out at us as you know directly being in contract, that anything that we were doing was violating any of our old policies. Um, but this is just, uh, this is more a measure out of an abundance of caution, as Dr. Hamilton mentioned, as this, as we get new guidance every day, multiple times a day, and as we gear up, um, you know, in the last minutes and hours before school starts, we don't, we don't want a technical um, policy issue from a policy from 15 years ago to uh, hinder our ability to, to uh, cooperate and abide by the guidelines that we're getting from health officials. Um, if I just wanted to mention that and just say that if, if as we settle into a, a, a policy or a procedure of how we're running the district in this pandemic this year, and if a conflict, if a clear conflict arises with an old policy, then we'll definitely address that. This is more of a, of a temporary measure to just make sure that we don't technically have a policy issue that hampers our ability to comply with, um, with the guidelines. Great. Good point. And then I have a question um, just for Trustee Saunders. We, um, has there been any movement or progress on the, the special or subcommittee about um, building names, which we mentioned a few meetings ago? Yeah, I did want to speak to uh, have a um, community involvement for the renaming of, of home school and Columbia school, um, but I haven't gotten there yet. So um, I'm going to work with Rick. Maybe I can get some uh, community members or uh, parents at that school, PTA people and parents to, um, to, assist, to assist in helping me rename that school. So more to come with that. Oh, by the way, if I may, Madam President, um, I think I sent it to you. I think I sent it to you. Yeah. We got notification from the state that they did uh, process our application. This is months and months ahead of when we expected them to do that. We weren't expecting that until, frankly, probably this time next year. 
um, but they have processed our application for the name change um, uh, to adding the Denzel Washington uh, program name to the Nellie Thornton uh, School. So that is official. It is the Denzel Washington School of the Arts at the Nellie Thornton campus. So the state has approved that application and I'm very glad that we can put a button on that now and maybe they will process the other name changes as quickly as soon as the committee comes forth with those recommendations. Mm. I had a question about that actually. Did we, did we ever finalize the, I, I saw in, the, in the, the COVID plan, it's still using the old names of all the schools. You know, it still says elementary school and stuff. I, I thought we changed those officially, for example, from Trap Hagen Elementary School to just Trap Hagen School. Like, I thought we made those changes a long time ago. Um, the, you're, you're right. Um, we'll just have to double check that and look at what the state has processed and sent back to us so that we can update that. But that's a good point. Probably just force of habit, frankly. I think we still use the same old names as well. <laughs> we have uh, policies. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> Press yeah. it. Um, Dr. Hamilton, since you, you brought that up about the name change for um, the Denzel Washington School of the Arts at LA Point Campus, so um, the school beds code, so that changed, that's changed or is that listed? No, ma'am. That's that, that beds code. You know what? Let me not say that without double checking. I believe that beds code stays the same. I did not even look at that on the application, frankly. Give me one second and I will be able to answer that. Okay, because I, I have a question when you answer that, um, an understanding of that, because if the name changed and then the, the, the code would be under Denzel Washington's School for the Arts at Nellie A. Thornton campus, so would we have two big codes, one for no, Thornton or just? There will, that I do know, we will have one code, but I just want to know uh, nope, the bed's code is the same. It has not changed. So the, so the bed code would be under the new name, Denzel Washington School of the Arts at Nellie A. Thornton campus. Correct. Okay, so one other question, just clarify for me, because what was told to the community is that the program, um, performing visual arts program would be named um, Denzel Washington. Correct. Not necessarily, a name change of the of the school. The so building on the, the document it reads school name Nellie A. Thornton Performing Arts. And it says action name change. It didn't say anything about um, program. The the building the building name name is remains Nellie A. Thornton. Uh, the state recognizes the program within the building as a component of, of that school. So it is in the district, we can refer to it any way we want to, um, but the state recognizes the program within the building as the Denzel Washington School of the Arts and designates that building as the Nellie A. Thornton building. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Hamilton, uh, really quick, and this, uh, this might be a little bit off, off uh, target for one second. We have an incredible influx of questions about all the cuts and that are happening with the, uh, of course, everything, reading, uh, reading specialists, TAs, everything. Tomorrow, your broadcast that you've announced and we've pretty much communicated across all lines of uh, communication as possible, you will be addressing questions from the public to, to address all of these questions, right? We, I mean, we've got a great deal of questions that are Great. from the public right now. I mean, it's on fire about, yes. uh, about program, about everything you can imagine except for the color of your shoes right now. Uh, well, the, the Facebook Live is about the reopening plan in September. It's not about the cuts. Um, I mean, I will not answer any questions that come up, but there will be, these are personnel related questions and there are some things I won't be able to speak to if it gets specific to personnel, uh, but that is not the purpose of the Facebook Live. But like I said, if people come on and that's their question, I'll certainly answer that. Um, but some of those questions, you know, if people are want to know who's being impacted and who's being um, uh, impacted in terms of which positions are being cut, I wouldn't be able to give them that kind of specificity because it is personal related. 
Yeah, I don't think that that's the I don't think that's the target. I think the target oh, okay. is really a, a, it's a lot of really a lot of questions about why it's going to be pretty surface. I don't think anybody would ask such questions that are going to make put you in a position that you wouldn't be able to answer. I think it's really just trying to give the public a, a, a even better understanding yet again about why the cuts are here, why we're making oh, okay. cuts, and how it's going to affect, especially when you're talking about TH, you're talking about special education, you're talking about mandated programs for students and children who need them, they're mandated, we need to be protected from state, uh, from lawsuits, and our children just not getting what they need, and the public is very sensitive about that now. We have questions even about, you know, food and things and how things are being prepared. I I would believe we're going to have a bombarding of questions. So, and we're not really, we haven't answered almost anything about these questions today, just because that today is not a meeting. It's not the forum for those questions. So uh, I'm just asking that. Well, I appreciate that. And um, I will share, um, you know, in this, in this forum that we have carefully looked at these cuts and the board gave me a directive to cut $7.6 million in the budget. Um, and held me accountable for actualizing those cuts. And we're about 90% there. We have tried to make those cuts in a way that was through attrition, meaning retirees, vacancies, to minimize the impact directly on people. Of course, students who are required to have a TA will continue to have their TA. Uh, we have over 200 TAs in, in our district. I think that number is 213 to be exact. Um, and we will have to make some reductions in that area. It's impacting administration, it's impacting CSEA, it's impacting the teacher's bargaining unit, and it's impacting cabinet. Uh, so when you look at $7.6 million, um, this is gonna happen. I gave people a heads up back in May that this was potentially coming by sending out those notices. Um, the board uh, sent out a, a letter that captures the justification for why this directive was given to me specifically around certain uh, things that were still uncertain in this environment related to costs with COVID, the fact that we are still owed over $20 million from the city, um, that there are looming state cuts um, and in terms of our fine, uh, foundation aid that we anticipate um, and the board thought it was, was appropriate and prudent to be wise and anticipate that we could have a financial crisis if we did not create some sort of cushion right now. I can appreciate how unnerving this is for people amidst COVID and, and people's incomes being cut to begin with um, and families relying on resources they did, did, did not have, but there is no way to cut $7.6 million from a budget without it impacting people. Um, but I will say that all things considered, a great deal, and I'll, I'll be able to give you exact numbers, a great deal of these positions, uh, these cuts have been actualized in positions that don't directly touch individual people because those, and that's what we looked at, how to keep our organization as healthy as possible by minimizing the impact on people. Dr. Hamilton? Yes, ma'am. Um, without getting into specifics, um, were some of these um, employees, were they tenured in other areas and would they be able to apply for positions that are that are on, are on OWAS now? Um, in some instances, and we can bring Ms. Tiggs in, she can talk about uh, the certification list because she's worked on that very carefully. Um, but in some instances, yes, if people have uh, certification in other areas um, yeah, and they've, they've had eligibility in those areas, then yes, they would have an opportunity to um, make, make those applications, make that application. Ms. Tiggs, I'm not sure how much of that you, you heard, but the question was about um, whether or not people, it. okay, go ahead. I heard it all. So of the 15 reading teachers, um, all of them are certified in other areas. The, the top few have been tenured classrooms and we currently have five vacancies in elementary ed. We're looking to fill it with those. We are not hiring outside for any of those positions. 
Um, I was in contact with Rachel DePaul today because many of them also have SPED certifications, so we're going to offer them special education positions. We have two pre-K pre vacancies, so we're offering them that. So of the 15, um, all except two have certifications in areas where we have vacancies. Letters are 95% done to make this go out tomorrow so that no one's wondering what their future looks like when it goes. So after tonight's board meeting, they're all going to go. The previously tenured people, um, Trustee White, as you mentioned, they will automatically go back into um, their last tenure. And one of that earth science teachers was also certified in SPED. So they're also going to be um, go back to their SPED position as well. So we've looked, we looked at each and every one. And as Dr. Hamilton said, in addition to looking at where to make the cuts, one of the decisions that was made was also looking at certification areas where people can also remain gainful. So at the end of this meeting, we're all said and done. It's only going to be it will not be offered another position in the district. Uh, my concern is how will this impact our students? Because most of them are in need of reading specialists. So, so I mean, some of these schools will they be left without a reading specialist? Or not, so, Dr. Gorman's working on that. We looked at yesterday, we looked at was well, the number of reading teachers in each building for 1920. We looked at the number cut from each building because you had to cut by seniority and not by buildings. Right. So there is an example where one build, there's some buildings that didn't lose anyone and then there's some buildings that lost everyone. So he's working on it um, to reassign reading teachers. So buildings that might've had five might have three, but then a building who had who right now has none will have two. Okay, but so, to me that still is a big impact because if I had five reading specialists, I had five for a reason. Well, and I know well, we had to cut. I know we had to cut. So I'm just mm -hmm. let's look at that. with the reality. Remember, we have 16 buildings and we lost 15 people, so it's less of an average of one per school. And some of the schools did lose the numbers, lost a number of students as well. So they might have lost okay. some of the students with the rezoning. So they don't need five reading teachers either. I got you. I got you. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if we're ready, we can no, move on to the no, no, no. security. There was nothing said about the security department. What? We haven't finished the cuts. Again, we're only 90% done. Um, so we still have about $760,000 more. Okay. To go. <laughs> and how many cents? <laughs> we hope that this is all we have to do. Right. We pray that this is all we have to do. I have a question. Sure. Uh, so uh, 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 on Facebook, there's a question in regards to options for at-risk students. So when they take this survey... Are there some questions on there, uh, Dr. Hamilton, that you could tell parents that they're able to uh, answer? Yes, question number three speaks very specifically to needs that students have on that survey that we need to take into consideration. It talks specifically about what resources uh, do you need. So, I mean, and, and our teachers know that as well, but if there's something that parents need us to keep on our radar as we look at options that we are considering, um, they should put that on the survey. And, and question number three is broad, uh, so it, it gives okay. space for that. And so uh, when is the deadline for the survey? Uh, five o'clock today. <laughs> no, no, Dr. Hamilton, it's the second wave survey, which is going to launch on Monday and will close on Friday that's, the 7th. That's the, techno that's the te technology one, the one that uh, um, Trustee TJ, Trustee Turnquist Jones is referring to is the one that closed today at five. But we can extend that. If you're getting those kinds of questions, we yes. can uh, extend that so people have more of an opportunity. Yes, that okay. was the very next thing I was about to ask too. I'm sorry, Sophia. All right. That there's individuals who are asking right now. It's it's like the the feed is like 
Is there a new survey? What is the survey? Can you tell them what the survey is and for them to go so they can um, complete the survey? Yeah, it's online. If you could just ask jo Joe now to open it back up because it closed at five. If you could ask Joe to open it back up um, yep. and let's run it until, um, I don't know how folks missed it, but be that as it may, let's run it until Friday. Will that impact okay. our submission to the state? No. Um, is the 31st is the statement of assurances. I don't think it'll change the logistics of the plan, quite honestly. Um, but we could run it to the 31st. And then we have that next piece on whether parents and kids are opting in or opting out and the technology launching probably on that Friday the 31st to be closed on the 7th. So we could get decision to parents by the 14th. So let's open that back up and run it to the run that to the 31st. Um, yep, we'll do. And Rick, if you can remind me to put that in my presentation tomorrow on Facebook sure. Live, please. Thank you. And one more question, just to make sure none of those um, cut were retiring positions. Were they re retirees? Were they did they decide to retire? Uh, okay. Some were. There were some people who retired and those positions are listed because uh, they were budgeted. So instead of replacing them again to minimize the impact on existing people, uh, some of those positions actually are captured in re retirements. If we didn't do that, we would be impacting more people directly. Okay. Okay, are we good for now, yeah. <laughs> for the moment? <laughs> At this moment. At this moment, okay, like, right. right. In the beginning, there was a plan. Um, so could I have a motion uh, to approve the um, human resources? Uh, Madam President, can I ask that we go to, into exec before we do action items? Oh, okay, sure. If you don't mind. To discuss that in exec. Right. That's okay. List. So can I have a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of? Should, uh, should we pull this? Should we pull the HR tab and vote on the other ones? Or should we just um, yeah. there, there's tax assurances. There's there's a couple of things. There's that, a few things that may have questions. Right. Okay. All right. So we're gonna go into exec now. So Rick, which which link? Uh, do we have two links or one link or what are we? You're on mute, Rick. You're on. Uh, the trustees should all have a link um, in their e in their um, inbox for an executive session that was to start at eight thirty. That's the one we can use. Okay, so uh, so motion to enter. Motion. Uh, we said while we're going into executive session. Be more specific. How long we're going to be there? Be more specific about the exec and how long approximately we're going to be there. We need a motion to enter an executive session this evening to discuss the person, the uh, employment history of a particular person or persons, to review tax certiorari's, to talk about collective ne bargaining negotiations with the district's unions, and to receive legal advice from counsel. And we will probably need about an hour and a half. So that's two hours. <laughs> I would believe that's correct. <laughs> okay. Could I have a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So I'll see you. We'll see each other in executive uh, session. Um, Anyone Rick, if you can. Just in text, the, uh, text Rick. Okay. Rick, if you can put in the waiting room for me. Marcy Tiggs, uh, Dr. Gore, because I want to talk to the board first without without cabinet. So if you can put Dr. Gorman, Marcy Tiggs, uh, Kim Silver, the two attorneys. Yes, if you could put them in a waiting room for me and give me uh, authority to admit. Sure. Dr. Jack Nandon as well, Dr. Hamilton. Oh, and, and Dr. Dag Nandon. So I need a motion to return to public session. Motion. Trustee McGowan. Second. Second. Okay. Dr. Turnquist. In favor. Aye. Aye. All right. We're live on Facebook. All right. Is there, um, okay, 
I need a motion to uh, approve the human resource resolutions, item 6.1. Point of order, are we, are, we, are we not waiting for the others? I don't, I don't. It says there's a non-video participant, Rick. Who is that? Wanda, Melissa, and Brenda. Uh, well, Adrian made the motion. <laughs> well, Wanda says she wants cell phone. Um, yeah, because her, yeah. her computer, yeah. Oh, wrong button. I'm getting it. You, um, wait, I'm going to mute my video and call this from. Why isn't it coming? Jeff, it's not. Jeff, can you hear me? It's not giving me a phone number. Oh, it's, is, is there a phone number for webinars? Um, no, I don't see a phone number. Oh, you're not talking to me. All right. I just want to make sure that I'm not the, there's, I don't think there is an option for a phone number because it's a webinar and it's being broadcast on Facebook. That's why we had to use a webinar. I'll send it to her phone. Yeah, but uh, you had to just put your name, your first, last name, and the two email addresses. Mm -hmm. With your email address and, and then a uh, confirmation. Mrs. Crump is coming in. She's trying to enter the code now. Uh, Melissa is uh, in the attendee room, um, Rick. Okay, I'm, give me one second. All right, Melissa has it. You said Mrs. Crump is on her way, Dr. Hamilton? Yeah, she just got the most recent one. I'm sorry, I was on mute. She's, she's coming in. And you got to sign in all over again. Yeah, I had to do that too for some reason. Rick, Mrs. Crump is going to need the updated app. That's what the issue is because she's got to sign in all over. I'm on with her already. Oh, okay. Wanda's here. Darcy, thanks for calling a special meeting. I'm, I'm glad all this didn't get pushed to the next meeting. It'd be a seven hour long meeting. Yeah, she's connecting, she's coming. Don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll make another one for seven hours, Micah. Okay, all right, the next one will be long anyway. <laughs> 
You want to look and see if she's in the waiting room, Rick, because yep, I, I can hear her. In. Okay. All right. Bye bye. All right. Yay. Oof. We all here? Out of water. <laughs> the last swallow. <laughs> Is Wanda here? Yeah, Wanda's yep. here. Wanda's yep. here. Everybody's here, madam. Okay, okay, great. So may Wanda I please? I was going to ask Wanda and Warren, since we're voting, to unmute themselves for the time being. Okay. May I please have a motion to approve the Human Resources Resolution 6.1? Motion. Second. Any discussion? Any questions? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Opposed. Nay. Okay. Ms. Trump is in no. Motion carries. And I have a resolution to approve the business office of uh, a motion to approve the business office <laughs> resolutions. <laughs> Motion. Adrian's Second. motion. Second. Questions, concerns? Uh, I had a question. Uh, is Mr. Silver on? It can be. I, I just have a question about item seven and eight are both for transportation and both for the 2020-2021 year. But if you look at the actual contracts, all county only goes through September and then first mile starts uh, in September. I just want to understand what's happening. One is for summer transportation and the other is for the full year. Okay, but that's not a, okay. That's, that's what I thought. Yep. Any other questions? So this is 7.1, all those in favor? All right. Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Motion carries. Uh, I have a motion to approve 7.2 business office authorization to amend the resolution to pay Mount Vernon STEAM Academy teachers to attend summer training for project lead the way courses. Motion. Second. Oh, okay. Is that questions? Mr. Any questions? about this resolution? Concerns, clarification? Okay, being none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay. May I have a motion to approve uh, school improvement resolution 8.1? Motion. Motion to improve. Approved. Second. Trustee Saunders, second. <laughs> She's beating me. She's not even here. <laughs> it's the race. Really? Uh, I have any a question. questions about eight point one? Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, can uh, this is one that I didn't get a chance to talk with uh, Dr. Hamilton in advance about this. This is this paid by grant funds. The teacher center. Yes. 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 Yeah. Right. That's okay. And I see we're just continuing the same rent. All right. The district pays for this, but it does it through a grant. As opposed to the teachers union itself does not pay this rent. Exactly. We're just the, the payments are ciphered through us as the lead agency, as the uh, LEA lead agency. Got it. Okay. No more questions. All in favor? I had a question. Oh, oh. sorry, Trustee Crump. Yeah, I um, wanted to know if there was a possible um, math error. Uh, where are you referring to, Trustee Crump? Um, in the, 
What is it called? Uh, seven. Seven school improvement. The second um, attachment. Uh, backup uh, S twenty uh, one. Yes. Okay. Um, the, in the first um, description item, insurance for TC program, where it says um, 150 per month mm. times 12. If that's right, would be 1,800? No, it's 11,150. 1,150. Yeah, 1,150. Where are you? Look, you yeah, look I think like, I'm on the wrong thing because I don't see that. If you look oh. on the front page of the resolution, you have appointment, you have an appointment and then you have authorizes lease payments. And it says the lease payments are $1,150 a month times 12 months. Right. That's for the 13, 1,800. Yes. Yeah. I'm talking about the one above that. Where it says 150 a month. I don't 1, see 1950. I don't see that either. Which attachment? Yeah, which attachment, Mrs. Crump? I don't see that. The um second attachment. Let me go back to it. Let's see. S S21-1 backup teacher center okay. second P PDF. All right, I see what you're talking about now. All right. Um, Which page? Page three. Page three. Description item, insurance for TC program. Right, rent at 20 per annum. One fifty. That yeah, that's the insurance cost. Would, would that be 150 times 12? I think it's 1150. 11. No, see what she's saying. It would be 1800 right. instead of 1950. I think they mean 1150 per month times 12. No, no. No, you look at the wrong. You're not looking at the right thing. Oh, I, per annum, 150 a month. For insurance. For right. That would be 150 times 12. Would that be right? Which would I don't be have a calculator. Someone have a calculator. I'm, I'm doing it now. Okay. 1150. That's one. That's one month extra. It might be a, an extra one month fee, like a broker's fee or something for insurance. Sometimes that's what it is. I don't know. I'm just guessing. But well, the 11, the 1150 no. times 12 is 13.8, and no, no, 1800. Right, it's 1800. Plus an additional 150. So I don't know what that. Yeah, that's the question. Right. So maybe, maybe we have it for an extra month. I don't know. Uh, bring BC in, Rick. Maybe she can respond to that. A broker please. fee or something. Good catch. 150 times 12. Is eighteen hundred, not nineteen fifty. So there's a hundred and fifty dollar delta. Yeah. Right. So is it times you... twelve times thirteen? Right. That's what we're trying to figure out. I don't know. Rick, did you bring BC in? I was asking. I don't know. I'm text messaging her right now. Oh, she's not in the rate. Right... Oh, I'm sorry. Well, let's, let's uh, put this tab on hold and come back to it, madam. Yeah. Oops. All right, so how about um, the motion to approve school improvement uh, resolution 8.2? Before we move on, we just need a motion to table it. Oh. Make a motion to table it? Second. All in favor of tabling it, yes, yes. Aye. Okay. So okay. now Aye. a motion to approve 8.2. Motion, second, 
Any questions? Comments, concerns? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay, motion carries. Uh, moving on to the, uh, where am I? Nine one. Nine, yep. Nine one. I'm so tired. Uh, <laughs> A motion to approve resolution 9.1, approval of student services memorandum number 15. Motion. Second. Second. Um, I'm not, I wasn't seconding, I was reading Adrian <laughs> second. <laughs> any, any, uh, any, any questions or concerns about question. Okay. Uh, this point number six on this item, authorization to enter into agreement with Westchester Institute for Human Development, WIHD. What is that? What do they do and what is the cost? There's no uh, backup attached. Uh, WHI, that's the Westchester Institute for Human Development. Yep. Um, that's the, that's the WIHD. It is one of our um, service providers to provide assistive technology for students with disabilities. Most of our autistic children fall into that category. Um, and uh, the agreement is still pending, which is why there's no attachment to that. So it's subject to a mutually agreed upon uh, agreement. Cliff, where's Cliff? He's here. Are we voting on it without noting, knowing, knowing the detail of what it entails? I believe this is a rollover. I'm not, I believe, I know this is a rollover. I don't know the status of the contract. We may need to table this. Cliff, do you know what this, this mutually agreed contract, why it says that? Yes, I believe the contracts uh, on that one were already sent out to the provider. We just haven't received the signed copies back in yet for the board vote. Let me see. Should we pull that until the next meeting? I, I don't know what the urgency of getting it approved tonight is. Um, I know that we have uh, voted um, on occasion, we vote on resolutions without having the mutually accepted acceptable agreement. Um, and more likely, more often with contractors that we've worked with previously. Right. Um, because we know that there's a relationship there and there's an understanding uh, in terms of getting the mutually acceptable agreement uh, finalized. But yeah. BC may have uh, yeah. some better assent on that. Oh, sorry. Cliff. This isn't a BC tab. This is a uh, Felicia. Oh. All right. Uh -huh. So we're going to table. Is the board yes, I think we better that? motion to table. Well, can we can we just? I I only have questions about that one part of it. Can we just withdraw that one part and approve the rest? I don't want to hold up the whole tab. You can put a strike through through it if that's so if that's acceptable. It's fine with me, and I don't object. I just don't. I just don't know what it is. So we're going to put a strike through that and vote on the rest of it. That's fine with me. Make a motion to put a strike through and vote on the remaining. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. A uh, motion to uh, approve uh, buildings and grounds resolution 10.1. Motion approve buildings and grounds 10.1. Second. Motion to approve buildings and ground 10.1. I heard you. I'm waiting for a second. Oh. Second. Second. 
questions, comments. We did review the uh, uh, Ken Baviello, um, Melissa. I don't. I don't think you were on. He he reviewed all the change orders with us bef uh, in the first part of our meeting. Are there any questions? I know you're disappointed, Melissa. I know she really missed that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Abstain. Motion to approve uh, superintendent's resolutions 11.1. Adrian motioned, all second. Questions? Concerns? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion to approve uh, Board of Ed Resolution 12.1, to super, supersede board policies. Second. Questions? Concerns? <coughs> All in favor? <coughs> Aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? Abstained. Motion to approve 12.2, Board of Education, to extend tax payment period without penalty. Motion to approve. Second. Questions? Concerns? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Motion carries. Can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion. M motion. No round table? <laughs> oh, motion. and all right. Let's do a round table. No. Motion. All in favor. There's a motion on the floor and it's seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Cliff, take off that bow tie. You're making me tired. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night, all. Good night, everybody. Good night.